that uh, whereas uh, the West, the European Union, and the lawyers uh, in France and in the United Kingdom and in Germany keep saying territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine, I say, well, wait a minute. Wasn't it you, NATO, that destroyed the territorial integrity of Yugoslavia? Not only did you destroy it by giving recognition to all of the states that declare themselves independent, but you destroyed it physically. You bombarded Serbia to tear Kosovo away from uh, from Serbia. It's, it's absolutely breathtaking, the intellectual dishonesty that we see in academia. Then let's take this discussion into uh, the second segment and talk about Russia and Ukraine and, um, well, the legal implications and also what you are seeing um, as, as happening. You already talked in the first segment now about the, the danger of this conflict still going nuclear. And we are seeing that there's like NATO members who now talk about putting troops on the ground in Ukraine, which is absolutely crazy. It used to be something that they said would never happen. And now we are actually discussing it. Um, can you maybe tell us how you perceive this constant spiral of escalation that is that is at least 15 years old, right? Since 2007, at least, probably older, um, in Ukraine, about Ukraine. And you, in an email exchange, you distributed blame on both on NATO and on Russia, because you're clearly saying, no, the Rus Russian invasion in 2022 is illegal. Um, but at the same time, uh, provocation is a real thing. Can you expand on how you perceive this conflict? Well, uh, I am, in a way, rather pessimistic because the mentality uh, that has got us here uh, has not evolved. As a matter of fact, they're going deeper and deeper in the mud. You know the Pete Sager uh, song of uh, 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 up, uh, up to your knees in uh, the big mud. Uh, that's a song of the 1950s. As the case may be, uh, uh, we are digging ourselves further uh, and uh, we're not uh, getting out of this completely mistaken uh, mindset uh, approach to uh, Russia. Uh, I mean, the United States uh, is desperately trying to maintain its primacy, but it has already lost it and doesn't realize it. The problem uh, with uh, the uh, Ukraine war is that uh, Russia, since the 1990s, has been seeking assurances, has been seeking uh, um, assurances of its national security. Russia doesn't want to be the enemy of NATO. Russia doesn't want to be the enemy of the United States. I mean, Gorbachev and Yeltsin bent over backwards uh, to be uh, accepted into the West and to co collaborate with the West. I mean, this was, you know, one brief shining moment for humanity in which we finally could have engaged in nuclear disarmament because the Russians were ready for it. Uh, and uh, the Chinese at that time were not very... Uh, uh, important as far as the number of, uh, of warheads they had and so on and so forth. There was this moment of world peace that Bill Clinton personally demolished. Uh, and instead of bringing in uh, Russia and establishing a peaceful world, uh, he decided that for NATO to continue for NATO to have uh, a raison d'etre, they had to invent an enemy. And although Russia didn't want that role, that role was imposed on Russia. And as uh, Professor John Mersheimer of Chicago, as Professor uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, of Columbia have explained very well, uh, we thought we could get away with it. So 1997 was the first uh, expansion uh, of NATO eastwards in clear violation of the binding 
international law oral agreements of uh, George H.W. Bush and uh, James Baker. Now, our diplomat par excellence, uh, George F. Kennan, condemned it clearly in an op-ed, in a, uh, an opinion article in the New York Times uh, in February of 1997, saying this is madness. This is uh, a fatal error on the part of uh, uh, the United States, and it's going to lead to war. And uh, of course, Clinton thought we can just push it down their throats, because uh, we are, you know, unquestionably number one, and we have the power. And uh, Russia in 1997 was very weak. And um, so there were several expansions, including into the Baltic countries. That uh, was already quite a provocation, uh, but uh, the Russians, although they protested, uh, they were not um, uh, that alarmed, alarmed at the NATO uh, conference in Bucharest in 2008, uh, where Putin uh, was present and Putin protested. Uh, NATO conference decided that uh, Georgia and uh, Ukraine should enter NATO. Now, uh, uh, if, if there's ever been a provocation, uh, that's it. Because no country will allow being encircled. Uh, they already had the, the Baltic states. They already had Poland, you know, direct neighbors. Uh, so the idea of bringing in an old uh, Russian uh, province, which had been part of uh, Tsarist Russia for centuries, to try to bring Ukraine into uh, NATO uh, was a slap on the face of, um, of Putin. And he let it happen. He did not, he protested, but he didn't take any action. Yeah. But, you know, at that time, Ukraine didn't even want to become a member of NATO. And Ukraine still had an article in its constitution saying that Ukraine will strive for neutrality. That's the article that they kicked out in 2014 and replaced with, we strive to become a NATO member. So in 2008, Ukraine was still clearly itself, like, functioning as a, as a proper buffer. Yeah, but our uh, United States Agency for International Development and our national endowment uh, for democracy subverted uh, Ukraine, sent in uh, its so-called NGOs, non-governmental organizations, to destabilize uh, the government of the democratically elected uh, president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych. And then we supported and co-financed uh, the uh, Maidan uh, coup d'etat, in 2014, and that's why I always say the war in Ukraine did not start uh, on the 24th of February 2022. It started uh, on the 22nd of uh, February 2014 with the illegal, unconstitutional, fascist uh, coup d'etat uh, in Maidan. And um, there again, Putin did not want war. He could have marched in and kicked out this illegal government. Could say this illegal government is going to be a danger, uh, he, a, an existential danger for uh, Russia, and we won't have it. He decided to play the game according to the UN Charter, which is Article Two, Paragraph Three: Settle uh, the differences by peaceful means. That's, that's why you have the OSCE, you have the Normandy format, you have the Minsk agreements. For eight years, Putin patiently tried to settle uh, the dispute, and he was taken for a ride. You know it from Angela Merkel, you I... know it from Francois uh, Hollande, that they entered into the Minsk agreements in bad faith, just as they said, to gain time. And I, I completely, I utterly agree with you. Totally agreed with everything that, that you said. I must give, though, this one thing, which is that something that had happened in 2014 that we haven't seen before is that a state uses unmarked uh, military 
privateers in order to take over a part of a country. So Crimea was fairly and squarely under international law part of Ukraine, recognized also by Russia, and that takeover was illegal. But it happened, and it was it was but it was excluded from the Minsk process. Right, the Minsk process was supposed to address the rest of eastern Ukraine. Well, when I was uh, the uh, representative of the SG for the elections uh, in Ukraine in 1994, I went to Crimea to monitor the elections in Crimea, in Simferopol, in Yalta, etc. So I go to present my credentials to the president uh, of uh, the then still existing Autonomous Republic of Crimea, because it was an autonomous republic. Huh? So I go to visit the man. And the first thing he says, uh, And I felt like telling him, I couldn't care less whether you're Russian, Ukrainian, or Chinese. I don't translate. have a... Please translate. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I what No, that's what he said. He, you, you said it in Russian. What he did he me, say? He told me that, uh, please understand, Mr. Desires, uh, that we're not Ukrainians, we're Russians. And I said, yeah, very interesting, uh, but I'm here on a very limited mission, which is just simply to monitor elections. I mean, I cannot give you self-determination, but 20 years later, 2014, that came back in my head, because what did that mean? They were, shall we say, apprehensive of uh, the manner in which uh, Ukraine, even then, in uh, 1994, was treating uh, Crimea. And one year later, they lost their autonomy. The same as uh, Milosevic uh, removed the autonomy of Kosovo in uh, 1989. Uh, Ukraine removed the autonomy of Crimea in 1995, one year after I was there. But since I crisscrossed the country, I realized that the Donbass and the uh, Crimea uh, were uh, not only really were the majority Russian, they felt Russian. Their culture was Russian. They were oriented toward Moscow. They were not oriented toward um, Kiev. And here's where the United Nations failed, as the United Nations fails uh, so often. Uh, when Ukraine splits from the Soviet Union, actually unconstitutionally, because they did not follow the rules to uh, declare themselves independent. But in any event, that's another point. Um, the United Nations knew that this country was 70% Ukrainian, 30% Russian. And the East, the Russian part, uh, had to have, shall we say, guarantees. Uh, if you let one part of a country secede. You must allow one part of that seceded uh, part to secede also. So the most logical thing would have been to have a referendum uh, in Donbass and a referendum in Crimea and ask them, do you want to be part of Ukraine or part of Russia? Because that would have guaranteed them the stability of the new country. That was not done. That was an opportunity lost. It's the same thing with uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, there's no good reason in the world while uh, this artificial state, Bosnia and Herzegovina, should be kept together by force. When, if it splits from Yugoslavia, well, is it not more sensible to let then the Croatians go to Croatia and let uh, the um, uh, Serbs. Republika Serbska? Uh, rejoin uh, uh, the, the, the rest of the Serbs. That would have guaranteed peace in the region. But Europe, uh, with its ideology, with its abstruse ideology, insisted that this experiment, uh, that this artificial state uh, had to continue and denied self-determination to the uh, uh, Serbs of uh, Serbska. Uh, and to the Serbs, uh, to the Cro Croatians. Uh, now, uh, it, it, there are a whole series of errors where the United Nations acted wrongly, unwisely. But going back to Crimea, Crimea is 
shall we say, the classical example of the proper, peaceful exercise of the use Kogan's right of self-determination of peoples. Uh, the majority of the Crimean population is clearly Russian. And I have no doubt that if a uh, referendum had been held there in 1991 or in 1994 or in 1914, uh, organized by the United Nations, monitored by the United Nations, the result would have been the same. So here you have first the referendum called by the uh, parliament of uh, uh, of Crimea. First the referendum. Then the unilateral declaration of independence. Then essentially they have exercised the right of self-determination they are independent, the same as Kosovo made it. You're, spe you're speaking about 1994, right? No, I'm speaking about 2014. Ah, okay, sorry. I'm speaking uh, about this uh, um, referendum, which I consider to be completely legitimate. The, uh, the fact, uh, you see, Russia did not invade. Russia did not bring its banks into um, uh, Crimea. The, the, the did not occupy uh, the country. That's why I'm saying don't ever use the word annexation because annexation occurs when you have a military occupation against the will of the population and then you have, shall we say, an incorporation of the territory against the will of the population. That is not the case in, in Crimea. There were 25,000 troops by treaty in Sebastopol. Uh, that was part of the agreement. Now, there were, of course, uh, uh, shall we say, Russian soldiers from the 25,000. I mean, they didn't bring them in from uh, Moscow uh, in 2014. They were already there. And essentially what the uh, uh, Russian soldiers in uh, Crimea did is to, uh, shall we say, assure that the, memor the uh, referendum could be held without force being used by Kiev to prevent it. That is uh, what, for instance, in 2017, uh, the Catalans tried to exercise their right of self-determination and they were crushed by the Guardia Civil. Uh, and actually, I interviewed people who lost eyes uh, because of uh, shooting um, rubber bullets. I saw, I interviewed women, uh, women who were going to vote and they were dragged to the streets uh, by the police. In Spain, uh, in Catalonia. There was a lot of people who were beaten up uh, by the police. It was massive force, illegal force, used by uh, the uh, central power against uh, the Catalans. Well, I think the Crimeans, uh, having seen what had happened in Maidan, had every reason to fear that the same would reproduce itself uh, in uh, uh, Crimea. So the uh, Russian soldiers that were legally in uh, uh, in uh, Crimea prevented any kind of violence so that the referendum was smooth. No one was hurt, no one was beaten up, no one was killed. And uh, as I said, then the next step, once you have the legitimacy of a uh, referendum, which by the way, they did it right. They invited the United Nations to come and monitor. They invited the OSCE to come and monitor. They invited the EU to come and monitor. And everybody said, no, 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 no. Why? Because all of these organs were scared to give it legitimacy. So they said, no, 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 we, we, we won't. Uh, okay, if you don't want, do you want to organize it yourself? You see that there's a need for a referendum. You've just had a coup d'etat in, in Kiev. These people are scared and they have reason to be scared. 
And um, they hold their own referendum. The United Nations does, does not want to legitimize it. So then the next step uh, is that the parliament makes the unilateral declaration of independence, as that happened in Kosovo. You know, the judgment of the International Court of Justice uh, of 2010 uh, was very clear, stating that uh, a unilateral declaration of independence uh, by a province does not contradict or violate uh, international law. And then in Article 80, uh, or rather paragraph 80 of the judgment is very clear uh, that uh, territorial integrity uh, takes the backseat to um, self-determination. Hmm. Self-determination takes priority over territorial integrity, which it's a concept of international law. It's a principle of international law, but a principle that changes all the time. I mean, Frontiers have changed in Europe hundreds, if not thousands of times. And uh, so there's no reason, there's no sacrosanct uh, principle that cannot be adjusted. And certainly territorial integrity, read paragraph uh, 80 of the uh, advisory opinion, it's quite clear. So they were on solid legal ground in what they were doing. But they were still not part of Russia. That had to go through the process. The process is that you make a request to uh, the uh, uh, Duma, to the parliament of Russia, whether they are willing to accept uh, the reincorporation of Crimea into Russia. Uh, and that takes its time. And then when they decide that, yes, it is constitutional, it can, can happen, it goes up to the Constitutional Court. The Constitutional Court looks at it and it says that it is consistent with the Constitution of Russia. And only at that moment is it signed uh, by Putin. So this is actually a school book example of the way uh, self-determination should be exercised, uh, not by a bloody war uh, as has become necessary for the Donbass people, uh, to do this without killing anybody, uh, without aggressing anybody, just saying, we want out. There's been a coup d'etat in uh, Kiev. We don't recognize that illegitimate government, and we want to do our own thing. So, yeah. So your point is that although the secession of Crimea from Ukraine was illegal under Ukraine's own constitution in front of the inter of international law, there is clear precedence that would establish the legality of, of that process in which it happened. And one more thing that's really interesting is that Russia is highly legalistic, actually, because even with the Donbass, one of the most important things to remember is that, that Russia did not recognize these two republics for eight years because it wanted them inside Ukraine because that would guarantee that there's some stability and that would, would lead to federalization and that would lead to a buffer and they didn't recognize it. And five days before the, the, the whole thing started, they recognized them because you need to recognize them in order to, to exercise the right of collective self-defense under Article 51 of the Charter. And that's the whole justification. Uh, and they, you know, they're highly legalistically minded, actually. And this is why I get so furious when, when the West says, like, oh, Putin woke up one morning and got crazy. No, <laughs> clearly not. No, no, no. I mean, uh, the intellectual dishonesty of governments, that's something that you know and I know I'm used to them. What bothers me is the intellectual dishonesty of lawyers, the intellectual dis the dishonesty of academics. Thank God there are a handful of academics in Germany, like Professor Reinhard Merkel uh, of the uh, uh, University of Hamburg, who wrote an important article in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung saying that it was not an annexation, but that, that it was the exercise of self-determination. In the same uh, line, Professor Karl Albrecht Schachschneider of the University of Erlangen. Uh, he also has written extensively and given lectures on why uh, the Crimean uh, independence and reincorporation into Russia is consistent. 
uh, with international law. But the narrative in the West uh, is, uh, say, 90 percent uh, that it was an illegal annexation, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, well, what about uh, what happened uh, uh, in uh, Kosovo, the independence of Kosovo and the recognition by Europe of every single unilateral declaration of independence, whether it be Slovenia and Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, et cetera, et cetera. That was all fine and dandy uh, with the Europeans, as long as we dismantled, destroyed the territorial integrity of uh, uh, of Yugoslavia. It's amazing that uh, whereas uh, the West, the European Union and the lawyers uh, in France and in the United Kingdom and in Germany keep saying territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine. I say, well, wait a minute. Wasn't it you, NATO, that destroyed the territorial integrity of Yugoslavia? Not only did you destroy it by giving recognition to all of the states that declare themselves independent, but you destroyed it physically. You bombarded Serbia to tear Kosovo away from uh, from Serbia. It, it's absolutely breathtaking, the intellectual dishonesty that we see in academia. I mean, uh, all of these articles, I can send you a, a series of academic articles, very solid, that say the same thing that I'm telling you. So I'm not alone uh, in this position. You you read German, I'll send you the articles of Reinhard Merkel, uh, of Schachtschneider, and of several others. Uh, but uh, the fact is that the brainwashing in the West uh, has been and continues to have its uh, effect. Um, I mean, I would not be able to give this interview that I'm giving to you uh, to any um, German uh, television uh, uh, ZDF, where I used to be often in ZDF when I published my first book, uh, Nemesis at Potsdam, when I published my second book, Die Wehrmacht und Untersuchungsstelle, when I published my third book, uh, The Anmerkungen zur Verteidigung. I mean, I was in ZDF in ARD, I did a primetime special for by Richard Rundfunk, I did a prime town special for the VDR uh, on my books, etc. Uh, those days are gone. I mean, uh, they wouldn't touch me with a 12 foot pole. Yeah, because obviously you speak the way that you speak right now. But uh, but the you know the brainwashing and this the, there's something going on that is that is that I cannot yet comprehend, and that's the self brainwashing. I published a short little article in a in a in a magazine, an Austrian magazine, semi semi scientific, semi popular, and in 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 that same. Thing. There was a lot. There were a lot of uh, uh, um, condemnations of Russia, right? Because it was all about this. This 2022 and the person who published this, and this is written by historians. Written by historians, and the historian sold who out. published sold this, out historians. What else not just do? sold out, but but she she they wrote on Twitter that uh, this is the first time since this first time ever since since 1945 that a nuclear state attacks a non-nuclear state a non and i'm like what are you talking about what are you talking about i mean the soviet union invaded afghanistan uh, nuclear china invaded uh, 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 vietnam i mean what are you talking about the united states invaded invaded so many countries it said it actually said neighbor state neighboring state so the us is kind of safe in that one because it never invited a direct neighbor but but this is so wrong and you're historians you should understand that this this is a slogan and this but even historians get that done when I'm it comes say, to this uh, war. chapeau that they are historians like uh, Christopher Clark of Cambridge University. He's an Australian, actually, but he teaches in England in Cambridge. He's one of the few uh, who has a comprehensive understanding of history and who puts things uh, into proper context. But if I look at the Historische Zumpf in Germany, the uh, Association of um, Historians in Germany, it is a trauerspiel. It is so corrupt uh, that, uh, I mean, I used to be a member. I, I quit many, many, many years ago uh, because uh, they're not historians, they're politicians. Uh, I mean, the, uh, they changed the, uh, they 
commit those crimes of uh, anachronism. They don't respect chronology. They don't respect causality. They don't uh, try to be comprehensive. They pick and choose. Uh, they never ask the question, qui bono, eh? Qui bono from Cicero in his defense of Milone. Uh, they, uh, they are political hence for hire. But they believe it. I, I believe them that they believe that. I, be, I, I talk uh, to them and I believe that they believe in their own narrative. I just don't yeah, get why. Of, you see, I used to believe many silly things. And it took me, as I said, decades to break uh, with that indoctrination. They don't have the courage to break with the indoctrination. They have their comfort zone. They're happily thinking what they think, even if it's wrong. And um, uh, I already mentioned Immanuel Kant and uh, uh, Horatius Sapere Aure. Have the courage to use your brain, for heaven's sake. Have the courage to break out and question. The Germans have a wonderful uh, expression called Hinterfragen. Fragen and Hinterfragen. As to try as to go behind it. Past uh, the veil. Uh, they don't do it. Uh, they're, they're scared to do it. And there the Germans again have invented a word that I like a lot because you already in, uh, evoked uh, the uh, idea uh, of um, Denkverbote. Uh, little red light that goes in your brain when you realize you are going into a minefield, you are going into a dangerous uh, area. Don't think about it. Don't even dare to go beyond uh, the thought. So there is a psychological need of self-censorship. Not only do you censor yourself in not writing about certain things because you consider them dangerous, but you censor your own brain in not thinking about them. And that is what you're talking about, that these historians have self-deceived themselves, they have created their own comfortable niche, and they say, this is truth. And once I have taken that on faith, they don't question it anymore. And then they have intellectual peace. <laughs> they don't have any more debate. Their brains are properly numbed, and uh, they're happy simply echoing whatever uh, the mainstream media tells them to echo. Uh, I could name names, but I don't want to, uh, because uh, then we might be sued for libel and slander. Uh, but I personally know uh, many historians uh, that suffer uh, from this self-deception. Uh, but I also know as many opportunists who very, you know very well what they're doing. And they know that for their careers, it is uh, an advancement uh, if you say certain things and you, you do not say certain other things. So many historians, especially young historians, uh, ambitious, who want to get a professorship, etc., they know that if they uh, touch certain topics, if they uh, give a historical interpretation that departs, from um, the mainstream view, they're not going to get tenure. They're not going to become an ordinarius. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, in 1980, uh, instead of doing my habilitation with Andreas Hilgruber in Cologne, uh, I wanted uh, to be professor, and I'm sure I would have gotten a professorship in Germany at the time. Uh, but my life would have been Hell. I mean, Germany has become a totalitarian, authoritarian, intolerant state uh, where either you uh, follow uh, the politically correct line or they're going to ostracize you, they're going to fire you, they're going to destroy your career, your honor, your reputation, etc. I mean, I've seen it happen in Germany, and as I said, I'm very happy that I left Germany. I used to be at the Max Planck Institute for Ausländisches Öffentliches Recht und Völkerrecht in Heidelberg at the time under the brilliant 
Professor uh, Karl Göring and under the brilliant and intellectually honest and humanly honest uh, Professor uh, Rudolf Bernhardt. He was like a father to me. He was such a wonderful man. What came after and what is now at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg, I wouldn't go there if they invited me. But of course, they're not going to invite me. <laughs> and, and the best heads and the most critical and best thinkers Germany is still throwing out. Ulrike Guero just a year ago lost her lost her professorship in Bonn, and the the, the Arbeitsgericht has now confirmed this, the, the, that this was legal. Although, in, I mean, in my view, this is this is preposterous, but fine. The courts are in the service of the government. Uh, the courts are in the service of the EU, in the service of NATO, and uh, forget it, uh, they will destroy your career, and they would have destroyed mine. So I, I did well. Uh, I had actually two possibilities when uh, Professor Theo van Boven, the director of the then Division of Human Rights of the United Nations, interviewed me for the post, because I became basically the registrar for the Human Rights Committee. Uh, all the complaints coming in, I was I became the head of the uh, petitions department. So all complaints on human rights violations came to my desk. Uh, well, I joined the UN because I believed in Theo van Boven and I believed in our very small team. We're only 51 people. Right now we have, I think, 800 uh, in the Office of the High Commissioner. Uh, but the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has been hijacked like everything else. And it very much uh, follows the donors. So the donors have a huge influence on the agenda of the House, on the priorities of the House. Uh, and uh, I'm very critical uh, about it in my book, uh, The Human Rights Industry. But allow and me to refer to this other book of mine. It's a trilogy. Huh? I first wrote this one, The Building, A Just World a just Order, world order. Uh, because I thought it was necessary uh before i tackled uh the corruption of the human rights system and the hijacking of the human rights system the weaponization of human rights for geopolitical purposes i first had to show that uh there is another way uh that the united nations is akin to a world constitution and that uh we need principles so I collected, you know, shall we say, the most crucial principles of international law into 25 principles, which have been cited as the uh, Zayas of principles of international uh, order. And uh, look here, um, the then president of the uh, General Assembly, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, wrote, the 25 Zayas principles of international order are a modern Magna Carta. Actually, it's a much longer statement, but this is just uh, the, the couple of words. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Carlos Correa, the executive director of South Center, wrote, Zayas proposes a new functional paradigm of human rights for all. Um, uh, Sharon Venn uh, was one of the leaders of the uh, indigenous movements uh, in the United States and Canada, uh, and also an expert in international law. She wrote, uh, this book goes to the sources of law and justice and proposes pragmatic solutions to many problems, including those of indigenous peoples, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, as I said, um, before I showed that the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights uh, has been hijacked, as has the Human Rights Council, as has the Office, um, or rather the Organization uh, for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, as has been the International Criminal Court. I wanted uh, to show uh, what uh, approach must be taken to international law and to human rights if we want these uh, rights to be juridical, justiciable, and enforceable. And uh, I mean, the, the the book has had some impact, but of course it goes against the stream. And um, uh, obviously uh, the office is not going to uh, name me a rapporteur ever again. Uh, the office is not going to select me for a fact-finding commission, et cetera, because uh, 
as I explained in the human rights industry, uh, the appointment of rapporteurs and uh, the appointment of experts is so politicized uh, that um, uh, unless they believe that you are going to toe the line, uh, you don't have a prayer. You know what we have to do? We have to discuss these three books of yours separately because they they really deserve a, a, a discussion each. And we've already been talking for one and a half hours and I know that in one hour you have a next meeting. So we do have to cut it. it the, the discussion went in completely different routes than I thought it would, but it's just impossible to, to steer a brilliant mind like yours into a single well, path. So it, we have been has, going into several uh, ways, but I'm very happy. Yeah, I'm very happy. I'm very happy. Um, before before we close, I mean, I want to, I had a mass served for his soul, and I want to remember uh, Aaron Bushnell. I don't know whether you saw this young U.S. airman uh, who immolated himself in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. Um, I've done some research into him. He seems to have been such a wonderful human being, such a committed human being, not at all a crazy, not at all a wacko, and uh, very much involved in human rights and very much involved in, he was on the base in Texas. Everybody loved him. And um, he takes his iPhone with him. He starts telling you what he's gonna do. And, you know, you feel like crying out, no, no, don't do that. He's explaining that what he's going to suffer and he knows is going to be excruciating is much, much, much less of what the people in Palestine are undergoing. And he calls it genocide and he keeps walking very quietly, eh? very rationally. I mean, it's, it, he's not a madman. He is uh, not shouting. And when he finishes, he arrives there, he puts his iPhone on the ground, and he takes a bottle and throws the kerosene on his head. He shouts, free Palestine, lights himself up, and then he cries out five more times, free Palestine. When you hear the last two, it is excruciating because you can imagine he's burning, he's dying. And then typical United States. I don't know who you saw the video. The police is there with a gun. You know, the guy is burning, he's dead practically. And there's the police not trying to save him or not trying to uh, put out the fire, but with a gun. I mean, it's a mad country. Where have we come? Where is human dignity? And uh, instead of learning the lesson that he's trying to teach us, you just turn the page and you forget. Oh, who was Aaron Bushnell? Oh, well, I had a mass uh, and I should have more masses uh, read for him and for people like him and for the people of Palestine. 35,000 innocent civilians. I mean, God, how can that happen? Yes. And, and then you have Olaf Scholz and Annalena Baerbrock and uh, Sunak and Macron talking nonsense and calling it anti-Semitic when you protest against the genocide. I mean, what kind of a world are we living in? That's why we have to rediscover the spirituality of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have to rediscover the spirituality that we had uh, after the grotesque crimes of the Second World War, that we wanted to come out of that. And we wanted to say, we're all children of the same God. I mean, we cannot be fighting each other as Jimmy Carter said in his Nobel Peace Prize uh, lecture, we will never have peace if we keep killing each other's children. And that's what we're doing. But in any event, we will continue uh, in the future. 
You're, uh, you're, speaking to, you're speaking to words that my, ha my heart is crying out every single day. We cannot continue like this. We've got to stop the killing, for Christ's sake. And uh, the people who say we have to continue the killing, those are the people who, who, <laughs> who we need to get back to reason. We don't need to fight them. We need to get them back to reason because they obviously, uh, obviously misunderstand. Um, Alfred Desires, it has been a great pleasure. And thank you very much for taking the time. I thank you for inviting me.